Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this, the 10th uh, lecture in our uh, special 50th anniversary inaugural lecture series. <clears throat> and what an anniversary year it's turning out to be. My name is Professor Kevin Hetherington. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Enterprise and Scholarship here at the Open University. I'm proud and privileged to be hosting one of the university's 50th anniversary celebration events which showcase our research, our teaching and our knowledge exchange. Now each year, the Vice-Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. Over the course of a year, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity to celebrate our academic excellence, with each lecture representing a significant milestone in an academic's career. This evening, we will hear from Paul Lawrence, who is the Asa Briggs Professor of History. He will explore with us how an historical perspective on crime and its control can contribute to contemporary understandings of criminal justice. It's apt for him to be delivering a lecture on this theme in the same year that the OU is celebrating its 50 years, during a time perhaps of reflection on the past and the present. Professor Paul Lawrence has taught and researched in the history department at the Open University since 1998. He is currently the head of history and holds the Asa Briggs Chair in History, a post that's named in honour of the noted social historian and former, former Chancellor of the Open University, Asa Briggs. Professor Lawrence's research interests include all aspects of criminal justice history from circa 1750 to the present. His current research and recent publications have focused on the Vagrancy Act of 1824 and the development and impact of PhotoFit as a technology of police identification. And he's also done work around theoretical reflection on the ways in which historical research can illuminate contemporary social and political issues. He is the current editor of the bilingual journal Crime, History and Society. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Lawrence. Hello everyone and uh, in the room and hello everyone who's watching online, if, whether it's both of you or all 10,000 of you, <laughs> it could be either. Thank you for coming to my lecture and thank you Kevin for that very generous introduction. It's quite unusual in academic life to be given what's called an open brief, to be asked to talk about essentially whatever you want. Um, so preparing this lecture has been really fun, actually. Um, a colleague of mine who can't attend this evening because he's poorly emailed me to say that he said he would be watching on the live stream and his daughter said, asked him, will it be like watching the film Frozen? <laughs> so I can't promise that it'll be quite that entertaining. Um, but I will do my best. Um, I've decided to focus my lecture around quite a broad and I guess fairly provocative question, what's the point of criminal justice history? This might seem a bit odd at this point. Kevin's just said, you know, you might be thinking, wait a minute, he's just been doing this for 21 years and he's only now asking what's the point. Well, obviously, I have thought about this before. I've for a number of years been thinking about this very question because it struck me, and I'm probably not the only one that this has uh, kind of struck, that there's quite a lot of criminological work which is very focused on the present and doesn't really address even the recent past very much. There's also quite a lot of historical work on crime and criminal justice that just sticks firmly in the past and doesn't really ever attempt to reach out to the present. So for a number of years now, I've been trying to think through some different ways in which we could have more of an informed dialogue between the past and the present. So, I've got a slide. Yes, sorry, if, if you might get slight motion sickness in the front row, but, uh, you know, just roll with it, you know, exit by the gift shop. Um, so before I start, I thought I'd say a few words just to frame this question a little bit more clearly. So when I tell people I'm the head of history at the Open University, I would say at least three quarters of people say exactly the same thing. It happened just last week with my barber. What they say is, oh, I hated history when I was at school. But then they pause a bit and then they go, which is weird because now I think it's really interesting. 
And I think you'd probably find quite a lot of historians which would agree with that. I certainly didn't like history very much at school myself, but now I find it really interesting. It's not always really interesting. I was at the National Archives a couple of weeks ago and I held in my hand the report of the Home Office Working Party on the Electric Blanket Safety Regulations, <laughs> 1971. So I did leave through it, but it wasn't the funnest day at the archives. But in general, I suppose the point I'm making is, I think history is fascinating. We are talking essentially about the record of everything that's happened in the world ever. So if you can't find something interesting in there, you're probably not looking. Um, but let's unpack that question a bit more. In what way is history then more than just interesting? So I've called this slide, I started to call it the problem of historical utility, which is basically just a fancy academic way of asking, that's interesting, but so what? So that's the kind of big question that I'm trying to address is, that's interesting, but so what? So to start to think about that, I'd like to consider first a particular crime which took place in 1849. So Bill, at the time, by some as the trial of the century. So on the 9th of August, 1849, Maria Manning and her husband Frederick planned and executed the murder of Patrick O'Connor, who was a moneylender. So they did him in and they buried his body under their kitchen floor. They then split up and fled. Not very successfully because Maria was caught in Edinburgh and Frederick was later caught uh, in Jersey. So the trial of a husband and wife attracted very considerable interest. So you can see here, maybe you can't read it, but that news report flags how crowded the court was from the very outset, and particularly how many women were attending the trial. Maria and Frederick were both sentenced to death. So their execution in November 1849 attracted huge public interest. It took place outside Horsemonger Lane Jail, which is in what's now Southwark in London. A crowd estimated to be up to 30,000 waited through the night to watch the double execution in the morning. Uh, Maria and Frederick were executed, that's a kind of rough woodcut, by William Calcraft, who was at the time the official executioner of the City of London, who was midway through a career which would see him execute in excess of 450 people. Newspapers, and you can see a little quote that I've typed out there, were a bit outraged that many apparently respectable persons had booked rooms to watch the double execution. Um, among them was this man who rented a room with some friends to watch the execution and was so horrified by what he saw that he wrote a letter to the Times the next morning. Again, in his letter, he claimed that he had attended the execution merely to observe the crowd for journalistic reasons. It's like, yeah, I'm sure that's what you were doing. You see there, he, was, he talks about the wickedness and levity of the immense crowd, the atrocious bearing looks and language of the assembled spectators. So he's outraged. So the letter writer, who some of you might have recognised, is Charles Dickens. So Charles Dickens, who's a noted writer even at the time, has booked a room with some friends to watch a double execution at dawn. So on one level, when I was reading about this, I was thinking, that's just really interesting, right? Uh, public outcry, the crowd. It is really interesting, but is it more than that? What can this lead us to in the present? I was reminded at that point by a quote that I quite liked. So this is Frederick Maitland. There's a picture of him there. Looks like he's reading the paper, actually. But he said he's an early legal historian who wrote, if some fairy gave me the power of seeing a scene of one and the same kind in every age of history, I'd choose a trial for murder. Because it would give me so many hints to a multitude of matters of first importance. So I think the device of contrasting the past with the present can be in some ways useful. So for example, the exa what I just related, the example of the execution of the Mannings, reminds us, I think, that punishment used to be a very social activity. If you go far enough back, punishments were carried out and delivered and executed by the community collectively. But even once the state starts to assume control of the function of punishment by the mid-19th century, it's still a social, there's still a social or communal aspect to the delivery of punishment. So I think these days we are very wedded to the idea still of 
justice being done in public in terms of court attendance. Courts are usually public places. But punishment has gradually slipped from view, from public view at least, behind the walls of the prison. And in fact, prisons themselves are no longer built in central, imposing urban locations like Horse Ferry Lane Jail. Uh, they're usually kind of tucked away in the countryside or on the edge of an industrial estate. So I think thinking about that, it might make us reflect a little bit about whether you know, this, social, this once social collective activity is now being administered in the right way. So that's an example maybe of something which is interesting and it maybe makes us think about the present a little bit. As Maitland says, it maybe hints at matters of the first importance. But for me, I don't know about you, that's a bit vague. In the example I've just given you, the past, it kind of problematizes the present. It makes you think differently about the present a bit. Don't get me wrong, that's a good thing. I think perspective from the past is good. But in the example I've just given you, the past doesn't really explain anything about the present just kind of causes you to kind of reflect a little bit. So in my lecture, what I'm hoping to do is to prevent, is to kind of move out from that and to decide whether thinking about crime and its control in the past can tell us anything more specific, anything more useful in the present. So what I'm planning to do in, in the remaining time of the lecture is to give you two different examples of that question drawing on some recent research. And looking around the room, there's probably maybe three or four colleagues who have probably heard all this before. So apologies for that, but you know, you can kind of brief me afterwards on what I, what I, what I got wrong this time. So I'll give you two examples. So I'll give you a very specific example uh, based around PhotoFit, which is a technology of police identification. And I'll argue there that there are some very specific things about the way in which the criminal justice system functions today that you can't really understand unless you take a long view. Equally, I'll give you what I've called a systemic example. So as well as understanding particular things in the present, I'll argue that it's only really via historical research that we can fully appreciate and understand how the criminal justice system, the law, the police, the courts, the mechanisms of punishment, how it functions as a system. And the example I'm gonna use there is the Vagrancy Act of 1824, which believe me, is much more interesting than it sounds. So first of all, PhotoFit. You may well be familiar with PhotoFit. So these here are PhotoFits. This one is a PhotoFit I tried to make of myself when I had a slightly different haircut, <laughs> which is, uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that lot. But okay. So the PhotoFits are composite kind of photograph photographic seeming images of faces built up from different facial features. But where does that technology come from? So I'm going to run through some of these images to give you a brief overview of the story of police identification techniques. So for most of the 19th century, when police officers gathered descriptions of suspects from witnesses, they would be written. So, you know, looked a bit shady, had a tattoo on his arm, that kind of thing. Circulate those. Then from the later 19th century, a succession of different technologies were used. So towards the end of the 19th century, the first artist's impressions started to appear. So this here is one of the first ones, which was printed in the Daily Telegraph in June nine, uh, 1881. So the criminal depicted there is a chap called Percy Lefroy Mapleton, who was arrested and convicted for the murder of Isaac Gold on the London to Brighton train in June 1881. So Mapleton and Gold, just really briefly, entered a first class carriage. You have to remember the carriages at the time, they're not interconnecting, so there's no way on or off the carriage except at a station. Mapleton emerged at Brighton, looking a bit disheveled with some splatters of blood and a gold chain coming, kind of sticking out of his shoe. Um, he was initially, there was no one else in the carriage, so the police who questioned him initially think maybe he's been trying to commit suicide, uh, but they, he convinces them that he wasn't, so he disappears. They then find the body of gold who he'd thrown out the train in the Hayward's Heath tunnel uh, and then need to find him. So they, this image is produced, it's printed in the newspapers and Mapleton's eventually recognized by his landlady and arrested and charged. As you can see, that's quite a, quite a profile. So you would probably recognize him. And this kind of ad hoc use of police artists persists into the 20th century. But obviously, 
Not many police officers are skilled artists, and it's quite expensive and time-consuming to get off, you know, artists in to work for the police. So the hunt was on for a new form of technology. So what you see here in this image is what's called an identikit. So identikit is a system developed in America in the 1940s, and it consists of a series of transparencies which are built up, uh, transparencies with line drawings of features, and you build them up to make a composite face. Identikit was first used in Britain in 1961 to identify the murderer of Elsie May Batten, who was stabbed to death in the antique shop where she worked in Charing Cross. So this, this is the Identikit which was released. Um, it put, it's circulated internally within police forces and also externally in newspapers, with the result that a police officer on the beat recognised this Edwin Bush, who's the guy who's convicted for it, and arrested him. So what have we got here? So that's what an identikit looks like. You can see here the, the different transparencies. And if I show you now. So if you look at the um, identikit here, and I can show you what Edwin Bush looked like. And actually, that's quite good. I mean, that's unusually good. Uh, so identikit then is, becomes the kind of technology of choice which police forces are using. But despite successes like this, many forces aren't really happy with this. It takes quite a long time to produce a decent identikit image. And because the kit is made in the US and has to be imported, they have a lot of problems with features in the kit. <coughs> so the police forces make repeated requests for hats. They want British hats, they want a bowler hat, they want a beret. They ask for, I think it's called a Robin Hood hat, which if anyone knows what a Robin Hood hat is <coughs> other than a, that would be good to know. Uh, they want kind of Teddy Boy and other, you know, UK-specific hairstyles which don't come with the kit. They also make requests for buck teeth and warts. <laughs> so, I don't so identity isn't particularly successful. You know, lots of forces don't like it, and the Home Office and the British police forces are trying to find a new thing. Step forward in the late 1960s, a man called Jack Penry, whose real name is Bill Ryan, but we'll come to that later. So he produces a new system in the late 1960s, almost coincidental with when the OU is being set up, around that time of innovation. And he has an idea for a new system with photographic replicas of facial features. So his system has five component features, eyes, nose, mouth, ears and hairline, and jawline. And a photo fit kit, I think I can show you one there. Oh, no, that's wrong. There we go. A photo fit kit, and you can see one on display in the foyer. If you haven't had a look yet, do have a look. So the photo fit kit has about 500 different variants of these features. So Penry then, with Home Office approval, develops a prototype of this photo fit kit uh, and um, as an indicator of how amateur the process was, and we'll come back to this later, he makes it in his dining room in Tunbridge Wells on the dining room table by cutting all the photos out and sticking them on pieces of cardboard. And as he later kind of recounts, you know, the, the central heating played kind of merry hell with all the things which curled up at the edges. Some f he convinces the Home Office, the Home Office commissions it and rolls it out. Okay, so... I won't say much about it now, but this... What, what I, the point I'd like to make is PhotoFit becomes the bedrock for a succession of successor technologies. So it, it's developed into a computerized version, uh, which just works on a computer, and then, which is called eFit, and then there's a video version is later produced, eFit V. So eFit V and some of these technologies are still in use, and in fact, PhotoFit itself was still in use until the, until the 1990s. So it's kind of an important technology that the police use. But here's the thing. Okay, what's that one? Ah, yeah, there we go, sorry. So there's the photo fit kit. Here is the man himself, Jacques Penry. Um, they launched photo fit at the Savoy in 1970. Times were different then. I think uh, it's being produced by Waddington's, the board game manufacturer, who make Monopoly. So they're the ones who lay on the champagne reception. There's kind of all the camera crews are invited. It's a big deal. The Home Office Minister who's present, big spiel, valuable innovation. By 1974, everyone in the UK is using it, 24 countries around the world. So it's quite a big deal. Here's the thing, though. They evaluate the prototype, and it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work any better than the other things that they've got. 
they kind of think, well, let's commission it anyway because we'll probably improve it. And then they test it afterwards. And it still doesn't really work. So my question then, when I came to this, was what? <laughs> so why does something that kind of doesn't really work, why is it commissioned and kind of rolled out? And to answer that question, we have to know a little bit more about this man. So this is Jacques Penry, whose real name was, in fact, Bill Ryan. Penry was variously described in his lifetime as a facial topographer, a psychologist, a journalist, an illustrator, a television personality, an inventor, and a boffin. I would probably call him an entrepreneur. One thing he isn't is a scientist. Um, this has been so much fun putting together. When I first found him in the historical record, which is in about 1935, Penry is working as a quick sketch artist at the big at private parties. So you book him for your party, he'll sit down at your table and sketch you. And while he does that, he'll give you a character reading, saying, oh, well, your features, I think you're probably this kind of person. So he's doing a gig at the Grosvenor Park, Grosvenor House Hotel, and he happens to do this sketch and give a character reading for a feature writer at the Daily Express. And the guy from the Daily Express is so impressed, he writes this up in the paper the next day and asks readers to send in pictures of their profile showing their nose, and Penry will then give them a character reading. And so they, lots of readers do this. There's a kind of headline in the mirror that says, the noses, the noses come rolling in. So that's how he starts off. But he realizes quite quickly that there's money in this. So he writes a book here. This is the cover of his first book, Character from the Face. The subtitle of this is A Complete Explanation of Character as it is shown by the size, proportion, and texture of each feature. So most of the book is pictures of eyes and noses and mouths. And it kind of says, well, this type of ear in conjunction with this type of mouth will probably be this type of person. So what Penry is essentially peddling at this point is physiognomy, the kind of long-standing 19th century idea that inward character traits are evident in the outward body. He then develops from this a long and very varied career, but essentially saying the same thing. It took me a little while to piece it together, but I'll have to be fairly brisk. So after he published the first book, he then gets a whole set of media engagements. So this one here is he was employed by Cowan Gate, the baby food manufacturer, who have a special kind of offer where you cut the coupon out and send it back with, with a kind of picture of your child, and he will tell you what your child will be like when you grow up. He also does a little line in, once we get into the kind of war period, he has a little line where you can send your own picture, and he'll tell you what form of war work you would be best suited to. Second, he then has a whole range of different yeah, newspaper gigs, both for adults and children. He is featured then on Pathé News. Oh, don't you, I think I've probably just got time to show you just a little bit. That eminent psychologist, Jacques Penry. So there it's he is. It's my business to detect and analyze facial characteristics. Every year I make my observations on approximately 20,000 people, and the majority of these are boys and girls. I would like you to observe for yourselves the vast difference between two young girls of opposite type. I shall illustrate these on the board. Uh, so I can't show you it all, but you know, maybe I'll show it later. So he's on TV a bit. He patents then, in the later 30s, a board game uh, called Fizzogs. You'll see here how much this looks like a photo fit kit. I also have a copy of that on the foyer, so do go and have a look at that if you haven't seen it. It's quite hard to outbid board game collectors on eBay. <laughs> so <laughs> they are fierce. And there's, you know, you know, there's one of those in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but it was cheaper to buy it on eBay. Anyway, so he does that. He writes another book after the Second World War, The Face of Man. He has his own mini TV series on the BBC in the 1950s called Let's Make Faces. Get celebrity guests. Um, he will sketch them. He's still peddling the same. If I draw you like this, it means you're this type of person. So don't forget, in the 1950s, there's not that many channels, and he's getting a large share of the viewing audience. However, by the time we get to the 1960s, this media career has all dried up. So he's writing to his usual contacts, and he's not getting anywhere. 
He's lost all, his, all of any money he ever had. He had lost, of all the things to have done, he opened a Canadian-themed boutique in Tunbridge Wells in 1966, which unsurprisingly, I don't know, maybe there was not a kind of big demand for beaver coats or... So he's kind of bankrupt, and in the last roll of the dice, he writes to the Home Office and says, hey, I've got a great idea that the police might be interested in. As I've said, um, there wasn't really any science. I hope I've kind of indicated there, it was quite brisk, but I, I hope I've indicated there's not a lot of science behind the development of PhotoFit. Um, early tests indicate it doesn't really work. Later tests at the end of the 1970s indicate fewer than 5% of cases that have a PhotoFit uh, is it of any use in solving a case at all? So why on earth then is it so? Is it kind of adopted and widely used? And what does this, albeit interesting bit of history, tell us that might be of use now? Well, I think there's a, kind of three maybe kind of things we can pull out of this. I think beware the lure of pseudoscience. So Penry cloaked himself quite convincingly uh, as someone with an aura of science. He presented himself as a psychologist, as a facial recognition expert. And we're often tempted, I think, to imbue artifacts which appear scientific or technological with a, a, an authority that their efficacy doesn't really warrant. Now, I'm not going to talk about it now, but if you think about some of the recent investigations into forensics companies who have been doing work for the police or for the uses being made of facial recognition software, or for the police use of so-called super recognizers. I think there are parallels we can draw from the implementation and rollout of PhotoFit, which are worth thinking about in relation to contemporary uh, commissioning decisions. I think the second thing, I'm not the first person, obviously, to say that technology is socially constructed, but if we want to think about why on earth this technology was adopted, it is the social context. So the police had had a series of scandals in the 1960s, partly around identification processes, partly around a whole range of other techniques and things that they were doing. A new scientific research branch had been set up, focused on the police, but it was really looking for new things to commission. The police were really unhappy with identity kit. So into this little social context popped Penry's letter. And it's that context, I think, which is kind of accounts for why the pseudoscience was so alluring. The other thing I think this flags up is that once commissioned, new technologies very rapidly have a vested interest wrapped around them. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. So that's almost the most interesting bit of this story is as soon as PhotoFit is rolled out, you start police forces start appointing PhotoFit operators and they start having networks and training conferences. So when the Home Office says this photo fit, how's it working out? There's a group of people in whose interest it is to say, oh, it's working pretty well. I think we could probably improve it if we had some more money. Uh, but the really interesting thing is that the, the psychologists, the group of psychologists that the Home Office employs to test photo fit, who initially say it doesn't really work, go on to develop a whole subfield of facial recognition psychology, which is still flourishing today. And I have colleagues at the Open University who are the kind of beneficiaries of that early work. And obviously the systems that there are today do work in large part much better than PhotoFit did. <laughs> so it's not a bad ending, but I kind of think that kind of the loop of what happens to a new technology is kind of an interesting one. And we, thanks to a colleague, Chris, we um, gave a version of a little bit of this research to um, some civil servants at the Home Office, and the bit about commissioning decisions taking on a life of their own got like the most nods. They had clearly had, they had recognised that. So a historical approach, I think, can tell us some interesting things about specific bits of contemporary criminal justice practice. And a last little plug there. So my colleague Graham Pike has produced on OpenLearn, which is our kind of freely available platform, this great little bit of learning material and an app called Photo fit me. So if you're interested in it afterwards, just to have a look, you can kind of you can go through this bit of the science of it, or you can also just have a play around and see how good you are at making a photo fit. It is harder than you think. Okay, what's next? So that's a specific thing. That's a kind of a specific example of something that I think you can only really understand if you look backwards. 
But what about um, something systemic? So my, my, my second type of example is focused more on the workings of the criminal justice system as a system. And I think by understanding the long development of different aspects of the system, the police, the courts, the mechanism of punishment, how that all interacts with politics and the public, we're able much better, I think, to comprehend and effect change in the present. And the example I'll use there is some work I've done on the Vagrancy Act of 1824. So the Vagrancy Act was passed as the culmination of several decades or more <clears throat> of quite rapid social change and a, a fear really about an, a, a growingly mobile and unruly population. So obviously the Act is in part focused on begging and rough sleeping and those bits of the Act are still in force today. If you get arrested in Westminster for begging, it's under the Vagrancy Act of 1824. It also has in it a prohibition of a huge range of other behaviour, and I've listed just some of them there. Indecent exposure, soliciting, fortune telling, I've seen publications, street betting. There's a whole range of different things that are kind of stuffed into this quite short act. The bit I'm going to talk about, though, just briefly, is section four, which was intent to commit a felony. So that's, what's interesting about that is we're quite used to people being arrested and charged and convicted for things they've done. But this is more about the history of people being arrested and charged and convicted for things they were suspected of being about to do, which is a much less well-known story. So don't necessarily need to read all of this arcane language, but that's a, just a little section of section four. And what it has, says is basically two things. The first clause is about what came to be known as going equipped. So if you are found somewhere with, say, a crowbar or something that could be suspicious, like maybe you're going to do something with it, you could be arrested and convicted under that. The second bit is almost more startling. It says that every suspected person who is essentially anywhere um, uh, with intent to commit a felony could be subject to the terms of the Act. And if you're convicted under the Act, you can have up to three months of hard labour for the suspicion that you were about to do something. So even at the time, that was quite significant. The kind of commentator Adolphus says, you know, they, people have noticed this. Whereas heretofore, no man could be apprehended but for the commission of offence. Being suspected by a magistrate now draws down all the penalties of the substantive offence absolutely committed. So this act is used almost immediately. So a few days later, after the act is passed, in a single session at Bow Street Magistrates Court, something like 15 people are convicted under the Act, including, I've got one there somewhere, two lads were charged with, quote, lurking about the avenues of the English Opera House with intent to commit a felony, and both of them were sentenced to two months' hard labour for that intent to commit a felony. Elsewhere in the country, there's from the uh, Exeter Flying Post, this is someone who was found near a foundry, so even though it says nothing was found on him, nor was anything that night missing, but of his bad intentions, there could be no doubt. So as you can see here, I think, so these are cases proceeded against under the Act. So the dotted line is the average. So it's about four and a quarter thousand cases just on this section four. And this stretches from... 1857 to 1970. So it goes up and down a fair bit, but there's a kind of, there's, there's it, the act is used quite substantially, I suppose is the point that I'm saying. So if we jump forward now to say the 1930s, um, you can see there's a notable spike in usage again. It's gone down a bit above our average, below our average, and then it comes right up again in the 1930s. So partly that is coincident with the struggle between fascist and anti-fascist demonstrators, because part of that is this act is very handy for just taking people off the streets. Uh, but it's not just about that. And what becomes apparent in the 1930s is a really interesting dynamic, where essentially the police slightly overstep the mark in the, use, in the zealous use of the act. There's a bit of a public outcry in the press. Um, questions are asked in Parliament. But then the powers that 
reaffirmed by the Home Secretary and the government. Um, so I think I've got a couple of cases there. So you get things like this. To 1933, Flying Officer Fitzpatrick. He turns out to be a decorated kind of flying officer. He's dropped off outside of town somewhere in London. He's walking home late at night. Two men approach him and say, who are you? You know, we're plainclothes officers. He says, I don't believe you. I'm not showing you what's my suitcase. He gets arrested, and then obviously it's all over the papers the next day. You know, decorated flying officer arrested. You know, Ronald Roberts, 1934, arrested while posting a letter at night. You kind of, these things kind of happen quite frequently. Um, and what happens is, you know, um, again, questions are asked in the House of Commons. The Home Secretary comes under some pressure. He then turns to the, usually the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and says, what's going on here? Metropolitan Police says, this is really handy. We really must kind of hold on to these powers. And then they're reaffirmed. So I think I've got, in, in this period in the 30s, there's a kind of intriguingly secret memorandum, stops and searches. So the kind of commissioner there is saying, the energetic deployment of the power of arrest is a most valuable means of checking crime. Without that power, the police would frequently not be able to act. But then, in view of recent press agitation, and given how the House can work itself into a frenzy about an isolated case, it might be wise to tighten the arrest guidelines. So they do. They focus on it for a little bit, and the Home Secretary says, yes, you can still keep arresting people. So... This might have carried on for some time, were it not for the fact that by the time we get to the 1970s, use of Section 4 has increasingly become used, uh, kind of bound up with its use against young men, often young black men, in inner city areas. So, I mean, that's what's one of the interesting things is, in the 1930s, it's mainly people over the age of 25 being arrested. In the, by the time you get to the 1970s, almost everyone is under 21. Campaign groups such as Scrap Sus, get formed in London and after a period of activism, while the Home Office is still trying right up to the last minute to hang on to these powers, um, they are eventually uh, removed from the legislation. Um, you can have a quote there from Lord Avebury as he introduces the bill to the House of Commons. It struck me that he's essentially saying the same as Adolphus was in 1824, that it's outrageous that a man of unblemished character can be sent to prison for three months when he has not committed any criminal offence merely because there's evidence that he intends to do so. So, quite interesting maybe, I hope, this kind of long story of kind of challenge and counter-challenge, but what does that actually offer us now in the present? Well, I suppose I would say three things here again. I do seem to like threes. So there's quite a lot of criminological work and kind of just a focus generally on what's been called the rise of the preventive state writings about pre-crime, and there's this idea that the state has recently stopped worrying just about post-crime, like what you do when someone's committed a crime, but has started to look pre-crime. I suppose one thing I would say fairly obviously is I don't think that's as novel as has sometimes been assumed. Um, second thing I'd say is that a broad conception of deterrence and prevention were part of policing right from the start. So the Metropolitan Police is set up in 1829, and kind of grows and develops alongside pieces of legislation like the Vagrancy Act. So I think the Vagrancy Act and similar pieces of legislation kind of really help to shape the way in which the police have tended to deal with certain sections of the public. And because of that, the repeal in 18, uh, 1981 isn't, I think, the end of broad preventive powers. So similar powers are embodied in a succession of different acts in the 19th century and in the 20th century. So because, you know, the police have arguably become accustomed to the deployment of broad discretionary arrest powers, they find their way into other bits of legislation, such as, for example, Section 5 of the Public Order Act 1986 or Section 44 of the Terrorism Act 2000. So I think what this demonstrates for me is that the historical roots of police culture and practice have some decidedly modern implications. So, oops. so we have two there. I've given you two examples. I could give you more. Um, two different answers, if you like, to the that's interesting, but so what question. 
I've had to give those two examples quite briskly because I know there's a wine reception waiting and I don't want to kind of hold you back from that. But I'll just make maybe a, just a few uh, concluding remarks. So in answering my question, what's the point of criminal justice history? Again, I, ha I have three things there. I think it does give what Maitland called um, glimpses of a multitude of matters of the first importance. So the development of the criminal law, the mechanisms by which crime is defined and controlled, the ways in which punishments are administered, are hugely significant social decisions. Even when the past doesn't explain contemporary practice directly, it does always, I think, provide points of comparison and reflection, which can prompt us to question and refine criminal justice today. I do think, and I probably would say this, a historical approach can do more than provide just this kind of perspective. While perspective's good, I really do think there's a role for historical data in explaining the present and in contributing to contemporary decision-making. And that requires collaboration, of course. I'm not saying that history is all you need to understand what's happening now, but I, I think a historical view should form a greater part of contemporary thinking about criminal justice than it currently does, perhaps. And finally, again, our, our contemporary criminal justice system has built up over several centuries. You know, the criminal justice system we have today is by no stretch of the imagination what we would design if we were to just design one from scratch now. Um, if we want to understand it as a system then, we can only do that by understanding how it's developed. <coughs> Questions of crime, its definition, its control, I think are really always questions about power and its social distribution. It's only really by understanding the long accretion of power as embodied in the criminal justice system in the past that we can work towards a fairer and more efficient system in the future. Thank you, Paul. We're now going to go and take some seats over there and we'll take your questions. Uh, hello, my name is Florin Sima. I'm from Romania. Uh, my question is, uh, what's your opinion on why does crime exist? Because there are also like Lombroso, Augustus Comte. What's your opinion? Why is there crime in the world? Wow, so nice easy. <laughs> nice easy one to start with. Well, I think one of the things that you kind of always focus on as an historian is that crime is, is, what is a crime is socially constructed. So it sounds a facile point to make, but things which weren't once a crime now are, things which used to be a crime now aren't. So in a sense, crime exists because we define certain things as crime. It's kind of short answer. If you are asking me why do certain types of actions occur, that's a kind of, it's a different question. So, you know, if you look back over the history of violence, there's quite a lot of work done historically on violence and murder. Uh, it tends to leave quite a lot of records. Uh, one of the overwhelming bits of evidence is that kind of lethal violence is in the main predominantly perpetrated by young men under the age of 25. And there's a whole set of kind of arguments about why that should be, but partly it's about impulse control and the kind of nature of young men. So I think in t in, in, as a broad answer to your question, things are a crime because we say they are, but then beyond that, you would have to look at different types of crime to understand kind of what brings that about. I mean, obviously you get, again, sorry to, uh, you know, you get a kind of, the more possessions that you have, the more acquisitive crime that you have. So if you go back 250 years, there wasn't actually a huge amount to steal, but you had various other types of issues. Okay, thank you. Next question. I think we've got one online, yeah. So the microphone at the front, please. Thank you. This has come in on live stream. It's from somebody called Sarah Merlin. How significant is an historical approach in a world of dynamic social and cultural change? Thanks. Yeah, I think what I would say to that is one of the things that history can do really well is tell you what is actually new and what isn't. So there's a strong tendency, I think, when studying the present exclusively to think of what is happening now as somehow novel and that can make it appear kind of unusual or overwhelming. And so in some cases, when you take a long view, there are some things which are genuinely new. Uh, it does happen. 
but equally, very often you can show what isn't new. And so it can kind of help to diffuse or take some of the tension out of things which are happening, happening presently. Okay, we've got a question at the front in the middle. I'm Chris Williams from History. Paul, you gave us some great examples of primarily from the 20th century, but also to an extent from the 19th. Do you think that history becomes more relevant in this kind of study as we get closer to the present? Or do you think there's a point beyond which, for example, we're not going to draw a great deal of lessons? Hmm. That's a good question. I think there is a strong tendency to view data and evidence from nearer to, the, to our present time as somehow more compelling. And I think to a certain extent that's true, but only to a certain extent. I think once you go back to a time where you don't have the structures of the state that you currently have, where kind of local justice is operates in a much more communal fashion, there is a point at which direct explanation of the present kind of falls away. And for me, that would probably be, as I said, around, once you go much before 1750, you're finding a lot of the structures of what we might consider criminal justice are not in place. So the direct kind of evidence that we might use is, 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 is lacking. But I would argue that much after that, you can find some very directly relevant evidence. I mean, there's some interesting criminological work about um, actuarial justice and risk. So there's a kind of whole thing more recently about how criminal justice has moved towards a risk-based approach. And there's some quite interesting work that says that's exactly what everyone was doing in about 1810. So, OK, question up by the, uh, the camera, this side of the room. Francis Chetwind. I should start by admitting to being a magistrate. So, um, the, I'm interested to know whether you think we should have got rid of all of our uh, sort of intent um, offences. So, apart from going equipped, I mean, possession with intent to supply and actually just possession of a bladed article, for example, uh, should we have kept? Should we have kept those or not? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I certainly wouldn't want to have given the impression that I necessarily feel these powers were never justified. I think what's interesting for me is the way in which there's often a temptation to think of the function of policing as just the application of the law, whereas actually policing is much more about discretionary action. So police officers have to decide in any given instance what, whether to enforce bits of legislation or not. And I think the kind of intent clauses come into that discretionary space and what's interesting is I think where the tensions arise is around how much discretion there should be so how, how much should the police be able to act on these intent um, intent clauses and I think sometimes as I've said I didn't go into it in so much detail but the whole 200 year period there's this strong tension of police kind of push a bit too far and then kind of pull back and that actually works quite well until you get to the 70s. Okay, question at the front, for about four rows back. Um. Microphone is coming your way. There we go. Um, Peter Leeson, just someone generally interested in continuous learning. Uh, there's someone, someone whose name I can't remember, said that those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it. Do you feel that the current pressure of politicians in this country and others to downgrade studies of things like history because these are not jobs of the future um, is in any way justified and does it reflect the fact that the decade following the 2008 financial crash resembled immensely the decade following the 1927 financial crash with the global rise of nationalist, isolationist governments? Hmm. Well, I think, how to answer that question? I think one of the, one of the interesting things that's happened to the profession of history is that it's gone from being an extremely confident profession to having a period where it's felt very reticent about speaking to the present. So in the early part of the 20th century, you know, historians would feel very confident 
becoming involved in politics, becoming involved in campaigning. I once did a quick tally of the first degrees of home secretaries, and you know most of them were historians, or it's, history was certainly the most prevalent degree. And you have some historians like um, George Gooch and uh, um, Gladstone who kind of move in and out of academic life and politics. What happens in the later part of the century is that you have the rise of social sciences, other ways of viewing the world, which have more of the ear of government. So the kind of Cambridge Criminological Institute and, and similar kind of organizations become the kind of default mechanism for finding out about things like crime and justice. Um, so I think part of what I'm trying to do and what other historians are doing is to kind of reinvigorate the confidence of historians to speak to the present. Um, I do think historians are often quite good at running things. <laughs> yeah. If you look at look at kind of management positions tend to often have historians. So I kind of have some hope that we kind of kind of redress the balance. I kind of feeling like you gave me quite a complicated question there that I maybe didn't follow. So sorry if I didn't really fully answer it. But um, no, I don't agree that history should be kind of downgraded in, in, the, in the curriculum. Indeed, historians, but geographers too. Geographers. Yes. Yes. Any more questions? Yes, got several hands now. So if we take one at the far end there and then we'll come back. Um, Mazali, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I primarily work in secure mental health services. So I've travelled down today from Rampton, which is a high secure hospital, people may have heard of. Um, the theme of my question is related to something you mentioned, it's preventative incarceration. Um, and I'm interested in your, your thoughts and observations on wh wh where you see the mood currently in, 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 in this country around the, related to the political, social and cultural aspects. and. Uh, in my experience, I see this vacillate and swing from one extreme to the other, uh, depending on what's happening or what's in the media or whether there's been a significant incident. Uh, so I'm just interested in your thoughts and reflections on that, please. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak to that with any authority. I mean, I think it seems to me that criminal justice incarceration is always is something that's been it's very difficult for the public, for, for politicians and the public to kind of come to a, a con consensus on. Um, if you look back in the 20th century, up until mid-century, say, there was a kind of strong feeling in the Home Office that crime and criminal justice policy shouldn't be something that was, you know, it was political, that there would be a kind of best way of doing it, and it would be best not to kind of campaign on crime and criminal justice issues. And that kind of fell away in the latter part of the 20th century, become highly politicized. I mean, from what I know, and I'm not speaking from any authority, there are you know, there is clearly a percentage of the current prison population which needs to be in prison for safety reasons, but it's probably a fairly small percentage. Uh, but, yeah. Okay, I think I saw a couple more hands in the middle, so maybe if we could take both of those questions together, and I think, if we, again, if we can get a microphone across. Hello, uh, my name's Denise Latner McLaughlin. I am actually a graduate of the OU in law. Um, you talked about how we redefine crime, things that were criminal are now not, and vice versa. But the age of criminal responsibility has stayed the same for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Do you think it should change? Oh, I'm just going to kind of skip that one. In the sense that, <laughs> well, I just don't feel that I can speak to it with any authority. Um, sorry. <laughs> We, we did have an inaugural lecture earlier in the year that Joe Felix gave that um, was looking at those kind of issues. I don't know if that's been recorded and we still it have it. It's, it's it has, so, so you may yeah. want to look at that and, uh, and I think it, that might be sort of pertinent to, to, to that question. Yeah, Person in the middle. Hello, my name's Denise. I'm from Captain on Sea. I'm studying law at the minute. Um, just literally started. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the talk, actually, because it's brilliant to look at all the history. Um, and also um, just picking up on another question um, about how the uh, criminal um, systems all shaped in the um, law that's created um, is actually done for ourselves. Um, so it's how we, how we like to see it today. Um, so nuisance and things like that, it's actually quite beneficial to ourselves. It's probably not a question, but just sort of thoughts of someone else's question beforehand. Mm. Yeah, I've certainly found it a really interesting process because I've not often studied the law that much, but that Vagrancy Act piece, as, as I hope I demonstrated, over a couple of hundred years, 
you go through, and what I couldn't talk about was all the multiple cases which come to the courts and then get challenged and go up to the Court of Appeal about what or what isn't, what is and isn't within the purview of the Act. So there's a big kind of thing in the 1930s about these two police officers have seen someone trying door handles of cars successively and they nick him and they argue that once he'd tried the first door handle, he then became a suspected person, so they could arrest him on the second door handle try. And this goes, so it's been really interesting to me to see the complicated ways in which the law gets kind of developed and refined. Okay. Mm. I think a question at the back, and then I've just seen another hand go up. We may Hello. have time for one more. Um, my name is Julio. I came uh, from Israel only for your uh, conference. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you, um, if you can explain to me what is the role of the indirect and direct uh, ways in where the religion and criminal justice uh, are related, more or less, maybe you can explain me. Yeah, that's again a nice big question to finish with. I mean, I suppose the further back, one of the interesting things is the further back you go, the more religion is is, is involved in systems of justice. So you'll be aware probably that you know in the Middle Ages there are kind of religious courts and there's kind of a whole the kind of the overlap between the state and kind of the uh, religious structures of power is quite significant. And there's a kind of transitionary period where you know once you move into the kind of 18th and 19th centuries where the older religious courts and kind of religious legislation is falling away, but the civil, the state courts are assuming certain kind of bits of legislation which are essentially morality. So some of the things around prostitution, for example, are essentially, that's obviously a big kind of topic, but is essentially a legacy of a religious worldview, which is then translated into a kind of, um, you know, a state-held court view. Okay, and I think we've got time for one final question near the back. Hi, um, I'm, I'm currently studying uh, law here at the OU, so I've, I'm just starting my first year. So obviously we've talked about the history of um, the criminal justice, the criminal justice system. What do you see for the future? Oh. <laughs> That's a good one to end on. That is an excellent question. Um, I see challenge ahead. <laughs> no. Sorry, I can't just get away with that. I think it depends which aspect of the criminal justice system. And again, I'm not really speaking here as a specialist. I think looking historically, the prison system and the kind of issue of what prisons are for, are they there for punishment? Are they there for rehabilitation? Is it a mix of both? Is a, is it like a real challenge which is being kind of faced and worked through as we speak? And I would say everyone, my colleague Roz has a display of her prisons project out on the foyer. So on the way to the wine, do have a look at that. Okay, thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you, Paul, for a really fascinating and interesting lecture and for answering the questions.